Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to take us underwater for um, half an hour and talk about the world which is out of sight and out of mind um, for the vast majority of us. But it is also a world which is experiencing the effects of what you just heard about in terms of climate change as much as anywhere. And, and, um, and the uh, impacts on the ocean uh, affect us all in a lot of ways, including the fact that the oceans are really the greatest buffer of the immediate effects of, of climate change. Um, the remarkable thing about the oceans is that um, the science of the oceans is really not much older than I am. I'm 76 years old. And the first great synthetic book of oceanography, which was written by the Norwegian oceanographer Harald Sverdrup, was written the year I was born. Rachel Carson's great book, The Sea Around Us, which um, attempted to synthesize our understanding of the oceans in a more popular way, is only from the 1950s, and we all have heard of Jacques-Yves Cousteau and the explorations of these great divers in the Mediterranean and around the world, and, and that only began in the 1950s as well. So unlike our understanding of the ecology of the land, the understanding of the oceans is very, very young. And uh, I work on coral reefs, that's my field, and, and really it's an even younger discipline in the sense that the very first time there was an expedition to go to a coral reef and try and figure out what's going on was in 1928, a year on the Great Barrier Reef. And our first understandings of the sort of geological importance of coral reefs and, and Darwin's theory of subsidence and, and, and symbiosis and all the rest of it was a kind of afterthought of the Americans' uh, horrible test bomb procedure on Eniwetok Atoll before we blew it up. We studied it to try to understand how it works. And, and when I began in my 20s to, to think about coral reefs and, and, and how they worked, um, this um, a great fellow named Tom Garreau um, published a paper in 1959, which was the first time that we actually had some sort of synthetic sense of the zonation of a coral reef, like the zonation of a forest to a meadow or whatever, and, and, and all of that. So it's, it's very, very young. And, and when I was a kid, and I was starting uh, in my uh, field, I, and I was thinking naively that I was going to study a pristine ecosystem. In fact, we had already woken up to the idea that humankind was destroying nature. And in 1962, which for me is a pivotal year, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, and Charles David Keeling, who was a colleague of mine at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, first started to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what you just heard about, and he discovered two things. He discovered that the Earth breathed every year, that's the, the sinusoidal variation as summer kicked in in the Northern Hemisphere, and the other thing that he observed was that the amount of carbon dioxide was increasing slowly and steadily over time. And in, in light of the previous talk, uh, he immediately realized that the predictions that Svante Arrhenius had made in the 1890s on the back of an envelope, that there would be a proportional increase in CO2 uh, because of the burning of fossil fuels, and that this would have effect on temperature, was well understood in the 1950s. And you think about how this debate has lingered because of dis deliberate misinformation, but it was really high school chemistry and physics that Keeling understood so long ago. And, and mostly when we think about climate change and mostly when we think of all the stuff that people do to poison the world we live in, we think about the land. But in fact, the, the impacts on the oceans are, are just as severe and began. This is an amazing, uh, amazing uh, map 
um, that was compiled by the great fisheries biologist Daniel Pauly. And what it shows you is the biomass of the kind of fish we like to eat, think cod, halibut, haddock, and whatever, in 1900 and then through the 20th century. In that, red is really good. It's a whole, whole lot of fish, and pale blue is really bad. And what you see is that in a century, we managed to essentially empty the North Atlantic Ocean of fish. Um, that's not to say that a lot of people don't say, oh, it's still great and there's lots of fish, and no, we don't need to be controlled, but the, it's pretty obvious from those data. Um, and, you know, back in the time of the 18th and the 19th century, those red areas in the 1900 graph, um, cod uh, was one of the most valuable commodities in the world, and it's gone now, at least on my side of the Atlantic. And the same sort of thing happened in coral reefs. These are amazing photographs. Um, imagine you want to go fishing, and so you go to the Florida Keys, and you pay a bunch of money to go on a boat, and you go out in the afternoon, and you fish, and you come back, and then the biggest fishes are put on a board, and you get your picture taken. And, and, and in the 1950s, the biggest fish every day, every afternoon, weighed more than 100 kilos, typically more like 120 or 130 kilos. Well, those big fish were pretty much gone by the 1970s, but you can see there was still a lot of fish. And now, all you see are these things that are this big instead of the things that are this big. And you're lucky if you catch a fish that weighs a kilo. Now, these are boats going to exactly the same place over 100 years, doing exactly the same thing for the same amount of time. And it's obvious that this is all gone, but as you can also tell from that jerk in the photograph, he's saying, look at this really big fish. And that's shifting baselines. That's this phenomenon that we all think that natural in the world is the way it was when we were a kid, and that unnatural is all the really bad stuff that goes on as we get old, which is why I'm a hell of a lot more depressing than the young people in this room. Um, but then kids don't listen to their parents, and they repeat the same mistakes. And before you know it, we've lost any idea or concept of what was natural. Um, and and um, then, of course, there's pollution. There's oil and plastic and, and these toxins that kill all those marine mammals like you see on a beach in California. But the kind of pollution I worry about is much more insidious and, and not visible. It's the pollution of organic nutrients that flow down rivers into the sea uh, that comes primarily from modern agriculture and secondarily from human sewage and waste. And this map is a uh, configuration of all the so-called dead zones in the ocean today. Um, there were maybe uh, 50 dead zones in the ocean when I was born. There are now almost 600. They're increasing at a very fast rate. Now, what is a dead zone? A dead zone is a place where the nutrient flowed into the coastal waters from the rivers full of nitrogen and phosphorus because of sloppy agricultural practice. And what that nutrient does is the same thing that fertilizer does on your lawn. It stimulates the growth of phytoplankton, and there's an explosive growth of phytoplankton, and the water can actually even turn color from the extraordinary density of the cells. And then these things die, and they sink to the bottom, and bacteria start to break them down. And in doing that, they use up all the oxygen. And so the, the water becomes essentially devoid of oxygen, and anything that can't swim away dies, which is why we call these things dead zones. And it doesn't, it's not rocket science to understand, if you look at the di distribution of bright red on that map, that the entire industrial coast of the United States is a dead zone, more or less, that the European coast is the dead zone. The Baltic Sea is the utter catastrophe of global dead zones. And as countries develop, um, the same is happening. So the whole coast of China is going in that direction. 
Okay, besides that, we have outbreaks of disease that we never saw before. The two pictures on the top there are of a sea urchin uh, called diadema, a black thing with long spines, and I can tell you we were very aware of their abundance as diving scientists because if you got stuck with one of those spines, it got infected and you were miserable for a week or two before it sort of worked out. And then in 1983, uh, in a period of a few months, a disease broke out and the, the sea urchins just lost their spines, rolled over, and were dead. It took about two days for them to die. And throughout the entire Caribbean Sea, and this was tracked from where it was first discovered in Panama, we think it entered the Caribbean by in ship ballast water or something, coming through the canal, it spread to the north, it got to Florida, it killed all the urchins in its way, and within one calendar year, it had made the complete circle, and this sea urchin completely disappeared. And that was catastrophic, because that sea urchin was the most important grazing organism on coral reefs, and everywhere after the sea urchins died, there were explosions of seaweed. And then what you see in the bottom of uh, pictures is the, I mean, it's very beautiful in a way, uh, the bright color, but when I look at that, I see death. Because the one on the, the bottom um, left, I guess for you, is what's called black band disease, and the other one is yellow band disease, and these diseases advance across the living tissue of the coral, and you can have beautiful coral reefs um, with very high, uh, cover of living corals, and within three months, diseases like this can kill virtually all of them, and instead you have a graveyard of coral. And then, uh, of course, from global warming, we have this phenomenon of coral bleaching, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. There was this massive bleaching event on the north coast of Australia along the Great Barrier Reef, where um, fully uh, one-third of all the coral on the Great Barrier Reef died within a year. What coral bleaching is, is the breakdown in a very um, beautiful and, and intricate symbiosis between the coral animal and the, the algae that live um, within the tissues of the coral. And, and it's a partnership. The corals give the, the algae, it gives them uh, nutrients and protection from predators. And what the algae do is they photosynthesize within the coral and they basically feed junk food to the coral. They, they provide sugar to the coral and it's most of the nutrition of the coral. And for most coral species, if uh, they don't have those symbionts, they will die. So, what happens, coral bleaching happens because the water gets too hot. It gets just a degree or two centigrade above the normal maximum that the corals experience. And when that happens, the, the algae inside the coral, they, they can't photosynthesize. So the coral says, uh, well, you didn't give me any food, you didn't pay the rent. So they kick the algae out. Um, but that's a kind of suicide if they don't get them back because the corals will themselves die if they, if they don't. So if the heating lasts for a very, very long time and there isn't the opportunity for the reestablishment of a symbiosis, the corals just die. And, and people now talk of global bleaching events and when we want to be really depressing, we talk about really the, the virtual elimination of coral reefs uh, around the world um, because of global warming and, and bleaching. And I'm not even going to talk about acidification of the ocean, you know, all that carbon dioxide that goes into the water, it's dissolved in the water, it makes the ocean a little bit more acidic. And so animals like corals and oysters and mussels that make their skeleton out of calcium carbonate, it takes a little bit more energy to do it when the oceans become more acidic and we can get really doomy and gloomy about that if we want to. Um, and, and where I worked in the, in the Caribbean, um, so when I was a kid and I first went to Jamaica and Florida and I started diving, the coral reefs looked like the pictures you see 
on the top. And, and it was really extraordinary. Where I worked in Jamaica, every full moon night we would go diving. And, and we'd, uh, we'd um, go down to 40 or 50 meters and we'd turn our lights off. And just the light from the moon, the water was so beautifully clear that you could see everything and you could actually do science without a flashlight in the middle of the night in 40 or 50 meters. But as the, the reefs have become overgrown by seaweed because we killed the grazers and because of disease and because of bleaching, so they look like the, the horrible mess you see in the bottom, the water clarity disappears and I can assure you, you'd never be able to do that. So it, it's this, this, this really um, tragic story of coral reefs. And, and to sort of summarize everything I've just been saying, we can think of the history of human impact on the ocean is that way back then, whenever then was, and it was different in different places depending on when people arrived, we started to impact the ocean by wanting to eat things from the ocean. So we exploited the ocean for fish and shellfish and seaweed. And then, you know, as we became more abundant, we started to pollute the ocean. Then we got really good as engineers and we started to just physically destroy the ocean habitats. And then as we began to sail around the world from one ocean to the next, we brought fellow travelers, invasive species, some of which explode and eliminate the native species. And then only recently, with the Industrial Revolution in the last couple of centuries, we've gone from local impacts to global impacts with climate change that you just heard about in great detail from the previous speaker. So it is this shift from local damage to global impact um, which is what keeps a lot of us up and down. And in fact, I gave a TED talk which um, gave me the title of Dr. Doom. It's, it, the, it's called How We Wreck the Oceans. And if you really want to get depressed, you just watch that talk and I, I guarantee you that it will have uh, the desired effect. Okay, so it's really easy to be doomy and gloomy. Um, but if you, in, in the, the in the sense and spirit of the, the presentation by, by, by Mr. Fry before, I, I guess that many of us feel that it, we, even if it's like Don Quixote tilting at windmills, that it's incredibly important to focus not only on all that bad stuff that's happened, but to actually gain some sort of courage and hope from the fact that we can do things better. And, and, and what I wanna do for the rest of my time is just tell you about some of the remarkable successes that have been achieved in terms of the conservation of the ocean, because I think um, we can really gather hope from it. And I'm gonna start out with a Norwegian example, um, something that the Norwegians in the audience should be really proud of because you have brought Barents Sea cod back from the brink and you actually now have in Norway and Russia the only sustainable cod fishery left in the world, a commodity that literally world wars were fought between England and France for this commodity which has now virtually disappeared everywhere else, including the coastal cod uh, here in Norway. But just through uh, very wise and, and adaptive fisheries management, um, that, that fishery has been brought back. It's uh, evaluated every year. And in fact, this year, because they're worried about climate change and other stuff, they actually lowered the catch. And so, uh, you know, uh, it's never over till it's over, and you, you always need to change your policy as it goes along. But this is an example that industry and government can actually act in concert not to destroy the, the resource that they have. And, and it's sadly one of the few examples, but it's extraordinarily important because it um, shows that it's possible. Um, now, this is one way of protecting a resource, which is by rules and regulations and catch limits. 
Another way of protecting a resource is to create something called a marine protected area where you just don't allow anybody to go in and exploit it. And my favorite example is of Cabo Pulmo. It's a little area uh, about the size of Trondheim uh, at the tip of Baja, California. And it was created, this protected area, by the villagers of, the, of Cabo Pulmo who were desperate. All the fish were gone, practically. They were, they were leaving. Um, the, the village structure was collapsing. And, and they said, well, you know, why don't we give it a go and we'll just ban all fishing. And if anybody comes in that wants to fish here uh, because we're not fishing, we'll just sink their boat, which they did with great efficiency. And within only 10 years, there was this explosion in the abundance of fish. And the, and the village is now very prosperous. Actually, they're making most of their money from tourism, but they actually have a sustainable fishery on the side. And it was utterly transformative, and it happened in only 10 years. And, and I show you this example, which is small because it's sort of a beautiful story, but it's also the case, for example, that on the entire California coast, similar kinds of measures have been resulting in, an, in a quite remarkable um, return of fishery stocks uh, to the point that they will be harvestable. Uh, but Cabo Pomo, you just have to see it from the air and underwater. That picture in the upper right, those are gigantic sharks swimming in a school. And that lower left picture, that's not staged. That's not an aquarium. That's what it looks like when you dive there. It's absolutely amazing. Um, but 10 years ago, you would have barely seen a fish. So it's this extraordinary story of success. Okay, another thing which is really changing attitudes about marine creatures is just understanding their movements and what they do. Um, and for me, the, the first great example of this was a book by Carl Safina. He's one of the great um, writers of conservation themes in the United States. Uh, he's a MacArthur Genius Awardee for his book, Song for a Blue Ocean. But the, the book that really moved me personally is this Eye of an Albatross. There's one albatross that had a, a, a transmitter put on her. He called her Amelia as in the, the flyer who disappeared, Amelia Earhart. And then he just describes what this bird is doing. And, and what it would do is take off from the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, go to Alaska, forage around for a while, fly for five, 7,000 kilometers in a week, come back, regurgitate everything it had eaten into the mouth of its chick, and in 15 minutes take off again. And so you get this dynamic picture of the life of this bird and the way it interacts with the ocean on this remarkable scale that you would never just know from a photograph. And then the, the big uh, map on the right is the track of tuna and sharks and sea turtles and seals and all these different kinds of organisms that have had transmitters implanted in them. You can see the process of doing that in a bluefin tuna in, in, in the lower left. And, and from that, we've been able to generate these maps. And from these maps, um, well, they have enormous scientific importance because they give us a notion of where we should be trying to protect stocks because we can see all the ways they go. But they also have a, a very remarkable effect on people when they come to realize that. And you can go to websites. For example, there's a website called the Great White Shark Cafe, and it's about a about hundred sharks that have been tagged that all have names that swim about a thousand kilometers off the south of Cal the coast of Southern California, hang out together, do whatever great white sharks do. And, and, um, and some of these sharks have been followed by five, seven years, and so, and people adopt the sharks. And if that sounds crazy, there is a burgeoning tourist industry of people who want to dive with sharks. I, I've dived over a couple of thousand times as a scientist, and I never had a deep-seated need to have sharks around. But um, there are people who are willing to pay thousands of dollars for the privilege of diving with sharks. Um, and there was this really beautiful study that was done um, about the island of Palau. Palau is in the western tropical Pacific. It's one of the most exquisitely beautiful uh, coral reef regions in the world. 
and, um, and the government of Palau was very concerned about overfishing and all the rest of it. And they brought in some people and they did a study. And they looked at what is their major source of income. And in fact, you know, something like 40% of all the money that comes into Palau came from diving tourism. And then we just, they discovered that there was this niche of people who just had to have their thrill of diving with sharks. So they took that, they thought about how much those people spent, and then they calculated what's the value of a shark during its lifetime, and it's $2 million. But if you kill that shark for the fins and meat, it's $100. So in other words, there's this more than 17,000-fold difference. And as people have come to realize that in Malaysia, in Australia, in Fiji, in all these different places, they're now protecting sharks because there's this um, rather bizarre desire for people to swim with them. Um, some species are worth a hell of a lot more alive than dead simply because of the ecosystem service they provide. Those beautiful parrotfish um, eat algae, and uh, in places where you have abundant parrotfish, you have beautiful coral reef. In places where we kill the parrotfish, we get these algal forests, and most of the coral is dead. Um, and, um, and so we now have um, increasing programs to protect these creatures that we call ecosystem engineers that, that are essential for the health of the whole ecosystem, which you might not have realized unless you have the opportunity to see what happens when they're removed. And then this is just an amazing story um, about rats. So a, a coral reef ecologist was working in the center of the Pacific and, and he was working around islands that were essentially devoid of people. And he noticed that around some of the islands, the coral reefs were really healthy, the fish were really abundant, and then around other islands that looked exactly the same, there was you know, very few fish and unhealthy corals. And it turned out that rats were the keystone species. In places where there were rats, they ate the baby seabirds, so there weren't a lot of seabirds, so the seabirds didn't poop, so there wasn't nutrient running into the water, and as a result, there weren't a lot of fish. And, and so this is, this is an example of just how intertwined and interdependent everything in the ocean is, just as on land, and how surprising it could be. Another great success story is the cleaning up of Tampa Bay, which used to be covered with seagrass, and then um, because of human pollution in this case, the seagrass all died and it became infested with seaweed, like you see in the upper right picture, and it really stank and people got disgusted, so they actually cleaned up the water and with 50, within 50 years, the seagrass came back. And, and then the last example I want to give is something for the future, but it's incredibly important. You know, there is this concept of freedom of the seas, which means that I have the right to go out and rape, pillage, and destroy anything in the open ocean because it's just as much mine as everybody else's. But we're now starting to talk in the United Nations and in other fora about the fact that that should not be. And that, in fact, if we protect the high seas, we will create the world's largest marine protected area. And that because the fish that occur only on the high seas are only about 2% of the global food security, from the oceans, um, that this is something where there will be very little loser and a great deal of winner. And, and, and in fact, it will augment the coastal fisheries that we all depend on. So there's a lot of really good news. And, and, and even, you know, even in the subject of climate change, I, I just grabbed these images off the web. Those, the, the, in spite of the very stable genius as he describes himself, who is the president of the United States. And in spite of his great support of coal and all the rest of it, we are making incredible strides towards making renewable energy the, the source of electricity. In the state of California, it's now illegal to build a house that doesn't have solar panels. The state is committed to make all of its electricity from wind and solar by, by 2045. So there are enormous advances that are being made 
But you know, it's really not enough. And, and, and sort of going back to what we heard in the first discussion this afternoon, I, laws are not, not, not enough, uh, renewable energy is not enough. It, it's us, it's our sense of consumption, it's the sense of all this crap that we buy and use that we don't. Look in your recycling bin and ask yourself, how much of that did you actually need? How much energy went into producing it? And what you're looking at is the future of the oceans. Because if we could wave our magic wand and make climate change go away tomorrow, the oceans would still be a terrible place if we didn't regulate the fishing, the waste, the plastic, and all the other things that are going to the ocean, um, which are uh, uh, the fundamental problem. Thanks very much.